In our overconnected, always on lives, we've created a world that author Dr. Richard Swenson says is only endurable under sedation. In our partnership with the American Leadership Forum, Kaiser Permanente's Dr. John Chuck joins us to explain why so many of us feel stressed and burned out and what we can do about it next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Dr. Chuck, why are so many of us stressed out today? Well, you know, we lead these uh, crazy, overscheduled, overstressed lives, and I, I think there are many factors that play into it. You know, you can obviously uh, point to the economy. Uh, you know, you think about how tough it is for young people to find jobs and to pay for homes nowadays. Um, you think about the, the uh, speed with which we've gained new knowledge and communicate with one another through the internet. Uh, it's just rapid fire uh, everything. Um, what I tell my patients is that they're subjected to multiple simultaneous conflicting imperatives. The acronym is MSCI and it's pronounced messy, right? There's just so much going on. Messy. MSCI. MSCI. That sounds yeah. like far too many of our lives. Yeah. And uh, I was reviewing some statistics. It, it turns out that from 1999 until 2012, the number of Americans on antidepressants uh, almost doubled from 7% to 13%. And about um, uh, one in five Americans is currently on some sort of mental health medication. How, how do you respond to those who say, you know, it's not that our problems uh, are more complicated, that our lives are busier, it's that we, as Americans have just lost our, our moral fiber and we've become soft. How do yeah. you respond to that? Um, there's probably some element of, of truth there. I, I mean, not a whole lot. I think that if we've lost anything as Americans, it's, it's we've lost our belief in some of, some of the systems uh, that have you know, help to keep us wise and informed and well in the past. So examples of that might be the American family, uh, the church, um, uh, the Boy Scouts of America. I mean, just, just institutions that people were committed to and connected to and believed in that fostered wellness, right? So currently we're just kind of, nobody wants to believe in institutions anymore. You know, you raise a family and then the kids scatter throughout the country. They don't even live near their hometown. They don't want to believe in the church. So they're just kind of left like grains of sand thrown down into the wind. And no wonder so many people are lost and disconnected and confused. It sounds almost like the, the thesis in bowling alone, which is <laughs> right. that, that we right. don't have bowling leagues anymore. Yeah. We don't have, you know, charitable associations or private associations where we get together and interact with each other. What has, what, what's behind sort of the fragmentation that leads to this isolation? Well, um, you know, once again, I think that in the past we had role models who's demonstrated for us how to stay well and be well. Um, wellness has always come from things like relationships, relationships with other people, uh, relationships with yourself, which some people call your emotional life, relationships with God. And now people are looking for a lot of their wellness in things, right? They're, they're miserable, they're stressed, so they're looking for quick fixes. So what are some quick fixes? Alcohol is a quick fix. Um, food's a quick fix. Um, surfing the internet's a quick fix. Uh, um, so uh, buying more things, you know, if I just get that Porsche, you know, Carrera, I'll be okay. But uh, uh, anybody in the know knows that those aren't sources of wellness or happiness. I mean, all wellness comes from the other things I talked about. And uh, one of the things I love is when my daughter graduated from high school a few years ago, uh, they picked their favorite teacher to give the talk. And he said, you know, what I hope for you all is not that you become really successful investment bankers in New York, but I, I hope that all of you at some point in your life partner with other people to work for a cause greater than yourself. And you know, you hear those graduation speeches, but then nobody does it, right? Everybody just kind of goes on their own trying to, you know, get quick fixes and to get famous and to start an internet company. And I, 
So I, I, think, I think that's why we're so lost, and I think that's why we need to refocus on some of the things we know make us well. Dr. Chuck, help us figure out uh, where we're at on this. How do we know that we are stressed out and burned out? What, what are the symptoms? Okay, so um, let's talk about some of the symptoms of being stressed out and depressed. I mean, depression and anxiety would be two of the main ones. So, for instance, if you're depressed, uh, you might have the feeling that you're not getting anything done in life. You might say, I feel depressed, down, and blue. Um, you might feel disconnected from other people. You may not be sleeping well. Uh, if you're anxious, you might say, hey, I'm anxious. But more often than that, you say, wow, I just can't get rid of this constant state of worry. Things is like this an episode or is this over a period of time? Well, you know, for some people, they have what's called um, uh, an adjustment disorder with depressed mood and anxiety. That, that's very common. That's normal, okay? We're not trying to stop that. You hear some bad news. You lose a job. You know, your sister's diagnosed with leukemia. That's totally normal to have those things. What we're seeing more of, though, is that people are facing sustained stress and they're having sustained depressed mood and sustained anxiety. That, that's where the real, real problem is. So, and then, of course, that leads to some of the um, unhealthy practices I described. So people drink more and now they're alcoholic or they get hooked on prescription drugs. So, so, so I, I think those are some of the things that you'll hear people say. Let's, let's talk about some of those self-medicating behaviors. So on the one hand, you feel down, right. and so you may self-medicate. Right. On the other hand, there's this pervasive feeling of being overwhelmed, of not being able to catch up, not being right. able to get on top of things, yeah. not being able to keep up. Right. And the other side of self-medicating is, I hear about college students taking medicines like Adderall and right. things like that right. so they can work for three days straight because they've got to get yeah. summa cum laude right. or that 4.6 GPA. Right. Tell us a little bit about the other side of that in terms of rather than medicating just to for palliative care purposes but in trying to sort of performance enhance ourselves in yeah. happiness. Yeah, well, you know, having two kids, you know, kids 21 and 25, and they've been through the whole, co let's talk about college applications in particular, right? I mean, people feel like if they don't get their kids into the right preschool that they won't go to Harvard, their life would be horrible. Well, first of all, you don't have to go to Harvard to have a great life. You know, you don't have to go to college at all to have a great life, but somehow we, we tell ourselves, you know, this story. So we, we start, you know, latching on to these worldly material things as our ultimate goals, which is like a recipe for disaster, but we do it, right? And, and then you and I will talk about how it's a bad thing, but then we'll look at our kids and they're in violin lessons and they're on the traveling soccer team and, you know, whatever, whatever. They have to have the latest iPhone and all that. So, so, so even though we talk about doing the right thing, we often don't do it. And, and, and then uh, uh, people are subject to all these stresses and stuff. I, I think that what sensible, insightful people have to do is say, stop the madness, right? I actually give a talk at Davis High School about how kids don't have to go to Harvard to have a great life. Everybody at Davis High thinks they have to go to Stanford or Harvard or MIT. How is that received? Uh, I think it's received well. I have so many parents in particular who come up to me and say, I've always believed that, but I wasn't hearing that from anybody else. And then kids come up to me and say, yeah, just thank you. you know, I feel so much stressed to get into this or that college. And it's nice to hear an adult say that, yeah, I don't have to, you know, to, to chase that, to, to have a good life and stuff. So, so I give talks like that. But then, of course, you want to tell people what they should pursue. So one of the talks I, go, I give is called Gear Up for Wellness. I like acronyms. So uh, G-E-A-R, G stands for gratitude, E stands for exercise, A stands for adaptability, and R stands for relationships. Gratitude? Yeah. Tell me what- I would love what, what, to tell you about yeah, gratitude. tell me about gratitude. So I'm a big fan of gratitude, and one of the world's experts on gratitude, Bob Emmons, uh, is a UC Davis professor. And uh, Bob did this fabulous research on patients at the UC Davis Medical Center with progressive neurologic disease, multiple sclerosis, things that should make you depressed and anxious, right? And the only intervention that Bob did was he had half of the patients do daily gratitude journaling, where the first thing they did when they woke up in the morning was they wrote down three things they were grateful for. And they couldn't be things from yesterday, right? It had to be three new things. And what he found was that in the intervention group, all the people who did 21 consecutive days or more of gratitude journaling, they had better health outcomes, they had better mood scores, and their family's perception of their wellness was higher than the control group. Oh my God, this was like an amazing finding because in the past everybody said, oh, gratitude and mindfulness, those are just soft sciences. 
there are real things. In fact, it was so remarkable that Bob got a $5.6 million grant from the Templeton Foundation to scale up that work. So, so, so people are doing research that's showing that many of the holistic common sense things that we've always uh, recommended really work, right? So yeah, antidepressants work to a degree, anxiety medicines work to a degree, but when you couple them with things like gratitude and exercise and mindfulness, you uh, emerge even better. That's really interesting. You know, there's an old axiom that says man and, and women, but man can make a hell out of heaven or a heaven out of hill. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Sean Aker, who, who's a Harvard professor, you know, um, he, he's not from Harvard, but he went there and he thought, well, when I get there, um, I'm going to find all these happy students because they're at the pinnacle of American education. Of course. And he discovered they're all depressed. And he did more research about it and he found out, wow, you know, um, he discovered what many people have known throughout time. Uh, happiness lies not in your circumstances, but how you think about them, right? So, so yeah, maybe your circumstances determine 10% of your mood or your happiness. But it's really the story you tell yourself about your circumstances that makes the bigger difference, right? So, so Viktor Frankl wrote in, in Man's Search for Meaning, he goes, hey, he goes, between the stimulus and response, you know, lies this space. And in that space lies your opportunity to make choices, uh, good choices, uh, about the story you tell yourself about your life and your circumstances. So, um, and then there's a fellow Antonovsky, a, a, a sociologist. So he studies survivors of Auschwitz, women in particular, and he discovers, he follows these women into adulthood, and he discovers that 17% of those women who survive Auschwitz somehow had this belief that their life was good. How could that be? In that those circumstances? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, you know, people say, oh, my circumstances are bad. Well, they're not as bad as somebody who survived Auschwitz. So anyway, he studied those 70% of the women, and he found that they had something called a sense of coherence. It's like three things, but one of the things that you just have this core belief despite the circumstances around you, that things are going to work out for the good. They just have that belief, right? So that's the science behind it. It, it can work, but oftentimes, you know, we face a difficult problem, and we don't want to read about the science. We don't want to find out about the science. We just want a pill, a and I get that, a and I help patients who want that, uh, but I tell them there's also a much bigger, more sustainable solution. So let's yeah. talk about that for a second. Fascinating topic, which is, a overarching criticism of American medicine yes. is that we are medicalize everything. We do. And so there is, there's Prozac and Zyprexa and Zoloft and all of the rest of the pharmacological agents yeah. that can be prescribed. Mm -hmm. and, that it, and some critics say that's just a shortcut for the healthcare system to help people do the hard work right. uh, of grasping and mastering the tools right. to be able to, to transact in life on a more successful, sustainable right. basis. Right, right. Uh, great point. You know, the devil's in the details. There's a lot of literature about how America spends uh, more per capita than any country in the world, yet does not come close to having the best outcomes. Oh boy, we could have a five-hour show about that. Super multifactorial. Uh, I do have this belief, however, uh, that if we spent 99% of the American healthcare dollar on mental health services instead of the way we do spend it currently, um, uh, the healthcare outcomes in America would be the same or better. And why do I say that? Well, because so much of our bad health comes are related to our lifestyles and the choices we make and mental health out of control, right? So I don't know who's going to run the experiment, but I, I firmly believe that if we just helped everybody to be mentally well, that their thoughts and behaviors would be better, and there'd be less gluttony, less alcoholism, less stress, and uh, less heart disease, less diabetes, I think we could do just as well. Currently, the way we currently invest in American medicine, we're enamored with high tech, we're enamored with new drugs. You know, uh, in my organization and every place, we do our best to practice evidence-based medicine, holistic medicine as much as possible, less drugs because they have side effects, but you know, we also face the pressures of our patients and the demands of our patients, right? Everybody wants a quick fix. But when you talk about evidence-based medicine, yeah. at least historically, right. it, uh, the, the connection between mind and body yes. and health outcome yes. has been uh, completely dismissed. Now, yeah. you're saying, are, are we entering a new era where it is that, that the medical profession it does believe that there is a scientific validity 
for this continuum between mind and body yes. and wellness? Yes, I remember even back when I was in um, college working at a paint store in the summer, somebody gave me this book uh, from Kenneth Pelletier called Mind is Healer, Mind is Slayer, right? So, so even back then, oh, and you know, thousands of years before, people understood that there, there's this huge mind-body relationship. And fortunately, not only are there people like Ken Pelletier and Bob Emmons, but every major medical center has a huge neuropsychiatric, neurobehavioral uh, research arm, right? And they're doing all these PET scans and seeing what lights up in the brain when people think certain things. So I think that you and I are still going to be alive to enjoy the benefits of all this great research and that we will leverage our knowledge about the, you know, the mind-body relationship to, to create a healthier world. I mean, I th I'm very optimistic about what's happening in American medicine. We're doing a lot of things wrong, but we're doing lots of things right. And a lot of the great research that's going on in mind-body medicine, you and I don't even know about. It's in the early stages. They're just starting to report on these things. But uh, I think I'm gonna keep practicing for a while just to enjoy all, the, all these great new discoveries that get played out you know, on the front lines with real patients. I would love a world where, not, where, where I'm not just sending people to counseling and, and giving medications and hoping they eat better. I, I would love to know more about the science of how the mind affects the body. Well, let's talk about how your organization, Kaiser Permanente, is, is integrating that change into how it is that you all provide service in the healthcare system because uh, if memory serves me correct, you, uh, Kaiser Permanente was in the forefront of starting to turn the conversation from purely uh, healing disease right. to wellness as uh, not just an outcome but as a permanent state. Yeah. How is it that your system has changed how you approach the interaction with your patients in order to bring them along that wellness right. continuum. Well, first of all, I want to say that while I have spent uh, 26 years with the Permanent Permanente Medical Group and Kaiser Permanente, I believe that there's great medicine being practiced everywhere. I have great respect for my friends at Sutter and UC Davis at Dignity. By the way, all of the doctors and nurses are on the same team trying to help patients. It's not me versus the other organizations. Sometimes you read that, it's just not true. I joined Kaiser Permanente because when I was in medical school, I was taught that evidence-based medicine is the best medicine. And then I always believed in prepaid medicine because uh, having growing up of modest means, I always thought that wouldn't it be nice if we lived in a world that regardless of your income, you receive the same care. So I like prepaid evidence-based medicine. And when I looked at the opportunities, uh, Kaiser Permanente did that well. So for example, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, we were started by Sidney Garfield, who was a surgeon out of USC and he partnered with Henry Kaiser to uh, 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 provide uh, health care uh, at Henry Kaiser's construction sites. And because he was prepaid, he said, hey, I'm really motivated to keep people healthy, not just treat disease. So he would go out to the work sites, and if he saw like exposed nails and things, he would pound them down thinking, hey, I need to prevent disease, not just treat it, right? So what I like about prepaid, integrated, evidence-based care is, the patients and the doctors and the insurance company are all on the same page, right? We all have the same goals, to help you live as long and as healthy as possible at a reasonable price. Anyway, so, so getting back to specifically like how, for instance, we, de we, we uh, diagnose and treat depression. So we leverage technology. So, so we, like all the health systems, have an electronic medical record. A patient comes in uh, and we do these surveys. There's one called the PHQ-9, there's one called the AOQ. But we actually follow the evidence-based screening tools for things like depression and anxiety. And then we, we do some more history with the patient and then we offer them suggestions for treatment and cure. And then we do the intervention, but then you just don't send them on their way. You bring them back and you track whether or not you brought them back and you track their mood and anxiety score over time. So that's just an example of an evidence based so, practice. So let, yeah. me, so let me ask you this. I'm depressed. Yes. I come in. Yes. You stabilize me. Right. You, you diagnose me. You stabilize me. And, and I am now off my medication and I've stopped. Right. I've finished my counseling or whatever else. Right. Help me understand the journey to not just being status quo, but moving to a new level of wellness in dealing with the stresses and anxieties that we talked about a little bit earlier. Yeah. What, are, what are some of the things that 
we all as individuals, not only as patients, but just as individuals, right. who may not be interacting with the, uh, the healthcare right. system right, right now, right. we can start to do yeah. to elevate our wellness and well-being? Well, first of all, you have to make a commitment to be well. Um, because if you don't have an intention to be well, given the world we live in, you will be sick. Okay, so that, that's first and that's foremost. Wellness doesn't happen passively in this fast-paced Western world. Maybe it does in some other parts of the world. For instance, um, there are five uh, uh, so-called blue zones in the world where people live to the age of 100 at a rate 10 times greater than Americans. And in these five blue zones in the world, they have nine lifestyle practices, which include things like movement and, and, you, and pushing yourself away from the dinner table when you're 80% full, living for a purpose, things like that, right? So of course those nine habits would help people live longer and better. But that's not the norm in America. We don't have those role models, although one of those is in Loma Linda. So if you wanna get some good role models, go hang out in Loma Linda. But in any event, so, so number one, it has to be intentional and purposeful. Um, I think it helps to go to a good source like, okay, so you decide you want to be well, you decide you want to adopt the lifestyles, you need to connect with, with a healthcare provider or counselor who can lead you on the way. But the great thing about the internet is that even if you have no health insurance at all, you could go on to the Mayo Clinic site, the Kaiser Permanente site, the Sutter site. All of us actually have a great interest in sharing evidence-based best practices for how to live well and be well. So, um, yeah, I, I think the great, the one of the good things about the internet, because there are a lot of bad things, okay, one of the good things is that if you're looking for it, there's good information out there. And I would go to, to a very well-vetted, trusted site. I mean, the two on the top of my mind are the Kaiser Permanente site and Mayo Clinic. There are many others, too. I'm just not as familiar with them. So, so I think there's a lot of hope, even for people who don't have health insurance. And by the way, even with you know, the Affordable Care Act, there are a lot of people, as you know, who don't have health insurance, right? It's a big deal. It's, it's a fallacy to think that, well, you know, we signed this and everybody has coverage. No, it's not true. And then of the people who do have coverage, a lot of them have huge copays and deductibles. Oh my God, up to $5,000. I don't have $5,000 in my pocket to just spend on health care. So in, in keeping with this theme of gratitude, positive thinking, and leaning forward into wellness. Yeah. Give us two or three practices that we can take away and start doing tomorrow. Yeah. In okay. fact, even better today. Yes, yes, yes. Um, in order to improve our wellness. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so the first thing, and it's a very concrete suggestion, and it's based on Bob Emmons' work. I would suggest that everybody watching this, instead of waking up tomorrow and saying, woe is me, because we have reasons to say, woe is me, right? I mean, don't you sometimes wake up with anxiety? Even with your perfect life, I'm sure sometimes you have issues. But what, <laughs> if, once in a while. what if tomorrow you wake up and instead of saying, woe is me, you wake up and say, wow is me. Like, hey, let me write down three things I'm grateful for today, right? So, so that's suggestion number one. It's just like- a, Wow is me. Wow is me, let's say it okay, together, I everybody, even, I, yeah. I feel better already. On three, wow is me. So, um, so that's number one. Anybody can do that, it's free. You don't need to see a therapist or anything. Uh, if you want to go beyond that, keep a gratitude journal. Just use a piece of scratch paper or a napkin. It's very low cost, low budget, okay? Uh, the second thing is, I would start eating some healthier food, right? Uh, many of us are very busy, so we just kind of default to fast food and unhealthy food, prepared food. But um, start going a little more plant-based. There's a lot of evidence that plant-based foods are healthier. You'll live longer, better weight control, less high blood pressure, less diabetes, and all that. The third thing, I would, let's just do three things, okay? Let's just do three. The third thing, I would seek out a mentor. Make a real human connection with somebody. Find somebody you admire for their attitude or their behaviors and say, hey, could you have, can I take you out for a coffee? I just wanna find out more about who you are and why you are who you are. And uh, if you're so bold, you might even wanna say, cause I wanna be more like you, right? I think people should, Stop building up 1,200 friends on Facebook and build up one or two good friends who you actually go for walks with and have coffee with and have, have a real conversation. Coffee. Kind of the like table. this. Like, you know, I never really knew you before. I'm having a great time. Maybe we could be friends. Who knows? I don't want to scare you, but maybe we could be. But yeah, make real you human it. connections, okay? Yeah, so, so how about those three, right? Uh, wake up with an attitude of I'm grateful, you know, wow is me. 
eat some healthier food, maybe lean more towards plant-based, and reach out to a mentor or, or reach out to just rekindle a relationship. Because uh, even mutual relationships involve, you know, two-way mentoring. The, what is the most hopeful sign that people are getting your message that is happening right now or you expect to happen yeah. in the coming years? I wish I could take credit and say this is my message because then I'd be a really famous, fabulously popular person. But it's a message of many people over the history of time. And um, uh, I don't know what the exact signs are that people are getting or not getting the message, but what I do know is that people are desperate for a message, right? People are desperate for a message. Brene Brown does a great TED Talk and she talks about the power of vul vulnerability. It has a zillion hits. Why is that? Because so many people feel so vulnerable. And right? we're going to have to leave it there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Chuck, and best wishes for spreading the gospel of wellness. Thank you so much for having me. And that's our show. Thanks to our guest and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.